When is the third installment of anything the best one? Last Crusade, Return of the King. On an unrelated note, I found another Knock Knock Show tape. This was new, old stock. It was still in the shrink wrap. If I had never opened this, it would have just sat on a shelf somewhere since 1999, never seeing the light of day. And yet, like the musty old white guys who unearthed all of those pharaoh's tombs in the teens and 20s of the, uh, the 20th century, we're currently in our own 20s. Straddling a century and a millennium just feels rude sometimes, you know? What was I saying? Oh, yeah, pharaoh tombs, ancient curses. I've unleashed a curse on me and on you. But this is more a mummy return situation than a mummy. We've been here before. I gotcha. But I'm no Brendan Fraser and you're no Rachel Weiss, so let's keep our expectations low and get this knock-knock show on the knock-knock road. Context lightning round. 1999, co-production of Christian Broadcasting Network and the 700 Club, the knock-knock show was designed to teach honesty to preschoolers and kindergartners by showing two grown adults in foam rubber foops foobly style outfits pretending to be little kids encountering dishonesty in their playroom. Mix that in with repetitive songs, weird puppets, nonsensically loud and obnoxious side characters, and some of the worst 2D and 3D animation you've ever seen, and you have a recipe for some viscerally vivid waking nightmares. Heads up, if you want to actually watch this tape, you can check it out in full on my second channel. There should be a button at the top of the screen now. I can never remember which side to point at. I'm not gonna point anymore. I've given up on that part of my life. As the opening credits roll, I'm still baffled by the weird 50s cartoon sound effects at play here. Everything in this song is just designed to be nails on a chalkboard to anyone over the age of 25. It's like the reverse of that high-pitched mosquito noise they used to play to get kids out of shops. So much to see on the knock -knock show. Turn around, things you learn about the show. And a lot like the last time I took a look at this show, the theme leads into a sub-theme, which leads into the Honesty Song. It's their running bit. Or maybe they feel like it's a Marvel-type situation where every episode is somebody's first episode, so they have to restate the theme in song. Or maybe they think they've got a Mr. Rogers style, it's you I like, on their hands. But it's mostly just annoyingly catchy. They're gonna sing this to people. Cause when you're true and you don't lie, you, you won't even have to try to have honesty. It just occurred to me though, it's training. The same songs over and over you're supposed to get up and sing. It's training for hymns and praise and worship and stuff. I feel dumb. I feel like I can't make fun of them for their green screen void anymore. I too have a green screen void. It's very useful. We enter our story mid-conversation. Dory wants to listen to Flo's new song. Woody wants to play hide and seek. Their voices still bug me. You can be a kid without resorting to this kind of grading imitation. You just have to embody the headspace, get in touch with the child within. First day of acting school stuff. Woody badgers Dory into one game of hide-and-seek before listening to the song, but they don't have enough people to play. In frustration, Woody accidentally opens the nightmare portal to the upsetting CGI jazz clown Jack in the Box, which is exactly as bad as it sounds. Wanna play a game? G -g Groovy! Ooh. Ooh. What kind of game? It's simple, you just hide! Hidey, hidey, hide. Woody and Dory have a lot of contempt for most of the characters on this show, and I honestly can't blame them. When everyone is this annoying, it starts to grate on you, for sure. Ooh, well, come on, everybody! Hidey, hidey, hide! Hidey, hidey, hide! They explain the rules of hide-and-seek to Story Clown, and he hides in the Story Clown dimension. More weird passive aggression from Woody, and they put the onus on us to play. Look man, I'm just here to watch the tapes. I have a strict non-intervention policy. I am the Switzerland of YouTube vintage children's programming reviewers. But we're in, regardless. The camera has gone from the neutral observer to the first person eye. The fourth wall shattered. They start to hide and we get a five second countdown. When our eyes open again, super off-putting handheld camera. Too much immersion, too real, too verite for this kind of show. Also, the focal length on this lens is way, way too long. It feels like you're being held off of the floor on the end of a pole. We find Dory pretty easily, and they use this opportunity to uh, teach us prepositions? Where am I? Behind. Behind. Where am I now? In front. Right. Let's 
let's go look for Woody. Okay. These shots make it clear why we spend most of the show at a comfortable three camera sitcom distance. Up close, these costumes are so shabby and disconcerting. When we're further away, it all blends into the wild cacophony that is the set and production design. Woody is under a table. The child is not bright, but he knows his prepositions too. Over the table? Under. A little light on the lesson planning on this one. Mercifully, we're back to the wide shot, and the Nightmare Twins try to pry the unspeakable jazz clown from his hell dimension to no avail. We've run out of our Lovecraftian CGI compositing budget, I guess. They're one down, hide-and-seek-wise, until Next Door Dog shows up. Next Door Dog seems to be the villain of most of these episodes, but he's so shaggy and friendly looking. But they're not supposed to play with him. Why is that? Next Door Dog, he's everywhere he wants to be. But he should be at home. His home. Oak! Oh. I don't know how well this sits with me. That feels kind of gently xenophobic. I know it's a dog, but it's a kid show. It's all about allegory. That's the most judgmental the parent pop-ins have been in any of these episodes I've forced myself to sit through. That felt weird. It sticks in my craw. They play hide-and-seek with Next Door Dog, and, well, he cheats, and finds them in the wardrobe closet pretty much instantaneously. To be fair, the door to the wardrobe closet was mostly open, but that could have also been because, you know, they weren't done hiding yet. Look, Next Door Dog, if you're gonna cheat, you gotta make it look like you didn't cheat. That's rule number one of cheating at games, otherwise you're just gonna get yelled at. Also, unfortunate prepositions here. Hiding in the wardrobe closet. Out of the wardrobe closet. And? Out. Where am I? In. What? Nope. Not gonna touch that one. Not that kind of show. The kids accuse Next Door Dog of cheating. Told you you were gonna yell that dog. And they really give him the business in a way that defines cheating for a young audience. Screenwriting, haha! -ha. He apologizes and we get the CGI versions of the twins singing the honesty song again. We only have one song to hold on to, one song to guide us. Woody, who has a memory that's about as solid as his object permanence, wants to play again with the cheating dog, but Dory reminds us all that there's another song waiting for us from Flo the Flamingo, another CGI nightmare that lives in the realms beyond. They send Next Door Dog packing and remark on the fact that this week's music is on a CD, not a record. Because records are old and for old people. Not us young kids who love... It's tapes now, right? We're listening to cassette tapes again? You know those are objectively worse, right? Is it, is it because they're prohibitively annoying to listen to and you have to make an effort to actually take the time and not stream something? Oh man, I might be into cassette tapes again. I already have too many tapes. No, stop that. We already did that. Go away. Anyway, I'm sure that this song should be totally innocuous and I don't have any need to steal myself. I'm sure this is nothing. When I play in the ocean breeze, sway in the wind like the tall palm trees, smile at fishes as I swim my way, it's such a make me happy kind of day. Oh man, this is gonna be bad, isn't it? On the children who can feel the beat, start the dancing with their own two feet. All the music makes you want to stay, it's such a make me happy kind of day. I'm a quip guy. I quip. I watched too much MST3K as a kid and now I make fun of things. I got nothing on this. This may be it for me. I don't know if I can do this anymore. Every one of these flow segments, man. It's such a make a happy kind of day. Yeah, man. That was fun, man. Yeah, man. Ready to play another game, sis? Yeah, man. But we need more people. And I'm back. Good lord. The fake dreads. The bad Jamaican accents. It's like a 1998 Carnival Cruise got introduced to a college dorm room Bob Marley poster in here. A reminder that we actually have kind of come a long way in the 20 or so years since this thing came out. This segment raises so many questions. Chief amongst them, why? Why do this? What does this have to do with cheating? What does this have to do with anything, really? We just needed to fill two minutes with casual racism? They make their way over to Doctor Who and she tries to do a rough Dora the Explorer for the kids. I guess we're just doing a tour of the world here. 
Hola, everyone. That means hello in Spanish. Hola. Can you say that? Hola. Next door dog crashes the party, apologizes, but doesn't get why cheating is bad. He doesn't think it hurts anybody. So now we get another animated segment. One of the interestingly animated ones, at least. They really run the gamut on this show between glorified PowerPoint presentations and actual network quality stuff. This segment is called Bafflingly Name That Coin. It's a Bible lesson shaped like a game show that tells the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and how he cheated people out of taxes, met Jesus, and reformed his ways. The game show part of the story doesn't really hang together all that well, there aren't any stakes, and at the end they basically tie when the dad slash host informs us that none of this mattered. We have one more question. Dory, if you get this right, you win! If you miss it, well, Woody's younger, so we'll call it a tie. And as far as Bible stories go, it's difficult to find one that's specifically about cheating in games. It's both too broad and too specific at the same time. It's all part of that general honesty kick, yeah, but it could have also just as easily been rolled into the episode about lying. Back to reality, and Doctor Who was really laying the moral lesson on thick. Maybe because that last segment didn't really cover anything beyond mention characters from the Bible. Cheating is bad because it hurts people, and it hurts yourself because people won't like you when they know that you cheat. Simple enough. Doctor Who pieces out, and Woody and Dory opine on wanting to learn another language. I wish we could learn more Spanish! No. Show, please. Don't do it, I'm begging you. You have the power to stop this. You can change for the better, you can- Hi, I'm Rocky Carey, and I'm here to teach you some Spanish words. The first one is hola. All right, we're doing this. We're gonna do cutesy racism, again. This episode has two themes rattling around in the near-empty maraca it calls a story, and it's cutesy racism masquerading as globetrotting cultural experiences and not cheating at hide-and-seek. That's it. That's all she wrote. Their cultural representatives for this song about learning to say Jesus loves you in Spanish are an anthropomorphic hot pepper and a bean in a hat. Hat bean. It has the energy of a white suburban mom who puts too much mustard into saying gracias and por favor to the waitstaff at a Mexican restaurant while somehow simultaneously holding the view that if people want to live in America then they should be forced to speak English. Maraca Carey sings her song, Mexican Jesus yeets the children off of his lap, and we're back to the twins. And much like the last song, they're, well... Senorita. Yes, senor! We shall play a game. Just gonna go on like this, I'm afraid. There's something about the layers of bad acting piling onto each other that's honestly kind of mesmerizing. They're undertrained actors pretending to be kids with thick, childlike voices, and they're trying to pile on bad pseudo Mexican slash Spanish accents on top of that. It would be impressive if it weren't so off putting. The twins decide to play Simon Says and give Next Door Dog another chance to not cheat. For some reason, this involves their mostly sound effects based and entirely nonverbal granny, who serves as an excuse to rummage through their extensive back catalog of bad library sound effects from the 1950s. Yay, Wrong Door Duck shows up looking for fish, and we get some more baffling non sequiturs from the pop in TV dad. For the best fishing hole in your neighborhood, call 555 Go Fish! fish. Missing a reference here? Anyway, they play Simon Says. Next door dog cheats again because of course he does. Cut to the honesty song, again, and maybe this is like an act break thing? A way to cut around story structure when it isn't working for them? I've been staring at these weirdos and their CGI void for so long now. How is this the first time I've noticed that their legs aren't keyed out of the floor background properly? It's the little things, you know? Back to the playroom, and Dory has a great idea. Let the serial cheater lead the game! That way, there's no way for him to cheat! Seems like the kind of reasoning a character raised on a diet of CBN in the 700 Club would be able to justify, yeah. He tells them to open the blue door, and now we're at an aquarium, where a blonde tween asks us weird, passive-aggressive questions. Do you know what an aquarium is? Did you ever wish that you were a fish? Your skin feels like a wet gummy bear. Hey, did you have fun at the aquarium today? Join. You like movies about gladiators? Wrong Door Duck shows up to do some fishing in the shark tank, thus completing his story arc. Congratulations, Wrong Door Duck. You had some kind of purpose in this episode, I guess. Chekhov's duck. But before we leave, 
one last question. Can you make a sound like a seal? <laughs> I choose to do this. I choose to do this. I choose to do this. And now we're back in the playroom again, and both next door dog and Granny are gone. I guess giving next door dog absolute authority over the game solved all of our problems. Lesson learned. The Joybirds pop out of the top of the wardrobe, the twins do their weird little flappy bird dance, and we're whisked away to the world of imagination, where Woody and Dory are cow folks in the Old West. We get some old school western stuff turned into low hanging fruit puns. I'm looking for the man who shot my paw! And sub Rugrats level child adaptations of adult things. I need a drink! Slashy! Ice cold! Make that toe, partner! Ooh! Give me a milk! Chocolate. It's yet another setup for Next Door Dog to be cheating, this time at cards, hence the Western setup. The thing is, there's such instant forgiveness for these transgressions. There are never any consequences for Next Door Dog. He doesn't have to really learn why his actions are wrong. And the right actions aren't modeled, either. As a lesson in a kid's show, it's kind of terrible. Out of the wardrobe, and the twins now offer to play another game with us. Mercifully, their parents call them off to snack time, though, and the episode abruptly ends. I rarely do this, address the audience in such a crass way, but I feel it bears the question. Every time I do an episode on the Knock Knock Show, more people than usual tune in. This means that there's an audience out there who remembers this thing, vividly, maybe even fondly. And I have to ask, what am I missing? While I do feel myself drawn back to the super fun cleanup site that is this show, I don't see how it could have held anybody's attention back in the day. So rather than finding some kind of witty closing remark, I'll end on this. A question. A prompt for discussion. Why? Why this show? Let me know in the comments and maybe we can find out together, and I can be free of this mummy's curse once and for all. Thank you all for watching Too Many Tapes. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell icon to get updates for when I upload videos. If you want to help out a small YouTube channel, consider donating a dollar or more a month to my Patreon. Your generous donations let me track down this tape on brand new sealed VHS. If you donate 50 or more dollars a month like Cami, you know, I kind of liked doing the whole themed recommendation thing last month. This month, since we're talking about cheating, I'm gonna go with con man movies. I'm recommending Frank Oz's 1988 classic, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. It may be my favorite Steve Martin movie, and it has, in my opinion, one of the best and most satisfying screenplays ever written. It's a delight. And Chase, this time around I'm recommending the 1947 film Nightmare Alley, which later got remade by Guillermo del Toro. The shape of this movie is essentially the same, but it has a griminess to it that del Toro's gloss kind of smooths over. If you donate 20 or more dollars a month, you're NATO Kitsch, and your name gets to be in the credits in an enormous font. Simon says, thank you for all of your support over the years. For $10 or more a month, you're the genuine hope that I never have to watch another episode of the Knock Knock Show ever again. And your name gets to be pretty big in the credits, too. And for $5 or more a month, you're a rousing game of hide-and-seek, and you get an early peek at my videos, which isn't cheating so much as it's a perk. Thank you all again for watching, and I'll see you next time on Too Many Tapes.